सो हेलो एवरी वन आई एम डॉक्टर ओमकार सोनोनी एंड लेट स्टार्ट अ डिस्कशन टूडे फॉर यूरोलॉजी एज यू आर क्वाइट अवेयर दैट वी हैड प्रीवियस स्टैंडिंग सेशन ऑफ सर्जरी सो द लास्ट पार्ट विच इज लेफ्ट इज यूरोलॉजी सो लेट्स डिस्कस अबाउट यूरोलॉजी नाउ इन टूडे इज सेशन ओवर यूर राइट सो टॉकिंग अबाउट यूरोलॉजी गाइज देर आर सम इम्पॉर्टेंट पॉइंट्स एंड द इमेजेस यू नीड टू रिमेंबर बिकॉज मोस्टली from urology images play a very important role and that's the reason why you need to at least remember the images from urology okay so starting on this note so first of all talking about the urethra so the male urethra the length of male urethra is 16 to 20 cm length of male urethra is 16 to 20 cm whereas the diameter is 6 to 8 mm diameter is 6 to 8 mm on the other hand the female urethra is shorter the female urethra is only 4 cm in length only 4 cm in length whereas 4 to 6 mm in diameter right then usually the male urethra if we talk about so please remember the male urethra is usually divided into a anterior urethra and the posterior urethra which are further subdivided the anterior urethra is subdivided into the penile urethra and the perineal urethra okay the penile which uh, is the part of the urethra which is in the penis whereas the perineal urethra is also known as the bulbar urethra whereas the posterior urethra is further subdivided as membranous urethra and prostatic urethra prostatic urethra is that part which is surrounded by the prostatic gland right important <coughs> so they can ask you the narrowest portion of the male urethra so please remember the narrowest portion of the urethra would be external urethral meatus narrowest portion of male urethra is external urethral meatus meatus means the opening so then external urethral opening is the narrowest portion okay if it is not an option the second narrowest part would be the membranous urethra second most uh, second most narrowest is the membranous urethra If they ask you about the widest part of urethra, so the widest part of urethra would be your prostatic urethra. Widest part would be the prostatic urethra. Okay. Then look at this image. What are these? So please remember these. This is a Foley's urinary catheter. This is a Foley's urinary catheter. Over here we can see usually it is a two-way catheter, but this one is a three-way catheter. Okay. This one is a three-way catheter. So the green one that is a 14 French catheter, and the orange one is a 16 French catheter. Okay, at least remember it has a balloon for its fixation. So once you insert this Foley's catheter into the urinary bladder, then you can inflate this balloon so it is fixed at that place. Okay. So important that only the image you need to remember that is a Foley's urinary catheter, right? Then if I talk about the contrast studies, the contrast studies which are there for the upper urinary tract, you would usually be a intravenous pilography (IVP) or a intravenous urography (IVU), right? IVP or a IV. you or you can perform a anterograde or a retrograde pilography anterograde or a retrograde pilography then if i talk about the lower urinary tract for lower urinary tract the contrast studies would be cystography which is for the urinary bladder cystography retrograde urethrogram which is for the urethra retrograde urethrogram rgu and micturating cystourethrogram micturating cystourethrogram is also known as a voiding cystourethrogram because this is the x-ray which is taken when a patient is voiding after injecting a dye okay so this is uh, this has all the contrast studies you need to remember then if i talk about the first anomaly or rather a first congenital anomaly of the kidney that is ectopic kidney right ectopic kidney means it is not at its original place right so ectopic kidney the most common site would be the left side okay so most commonly ectopic kidney would be present on the left side and the most common site of ectopic kidney would be the pelvis most common site of ectopic kidney would be the pelvis important right then if i talk about the next congenital anomaly that is horseshoe kidneys okay so horseshoe kidneys are what so please remember horseshoe kidneys are a pair of ectopic kidneys both are not present at their at their own places okay so horseshoe kidneys are a pair of ectopic kidneys which are fused with their lower pores okay so they are usually fused with their lower pores as you can see in the city image over here right so please remember pair of ectopic kidneys which are fused at the lower pores are known as horseshoe kidneys most common site of fusion has been asked in the question so the most common site of fusion is l3 l4 most common site of fusion for horseshoe kidneys would be l3 l4 
the first investigation that would be done in a horseshoe kidney as we have discussed most likely the first investigation that we do in abdominal pathologies would be a ultrasound abdomen right ultrasound abdomen is the first line investigation but the investigation of choice would be CCT abdomen contrast enhanced CT scan abdomen then we can also perform a contrast study that is a IVP intravenous pyrography and on that we can see a characteristic sign so please remember horseshoe kidneys on IVP will show flower vase appearance or a hand joining sign flower vase appearance or a hand joining sign important right then talking about the next condition and that is PCKD polycystic kidney disease polycystic kidney disease can be of two types either it is congenital or it is infantile the infantile variety is usually autosomal recessive and it is very rare but the congenital variety this congenital variety it has autosomal dominant pattern of inheritance and it is present usually in adults right it almost manifests at 25 to 30 years of age group the most common site so now in PCKD what happens usually there are multiple cysts in the kidney just like this CT image over here you can see there are multiple cysts in the kidneys fluid filled cysts will be there but apart from kidneys there can also be cysts in other organs so the most common site for extra renal cysts would be liver most common site for extra renal cysts would be liver okay the investigation of choice for this condition would be a CECT abdomen again investigation of choice would be a CECT abdomen treatment for this uh, polycystic kidney disease would be de-roofing of this cyst okay this cyst should be de-roofed okay their covering should be removed that is de-roofing of the cyst but the best treatment would usually be a renal transplant finally because there is a high chance of recurrence so therefore the best treatment for PCKD would be a renal transplant important points about renal transplant the most common site for renal transplant would be left iliac fossa most common site for renal transplant would be the left iliac fossa important okay please remember and before a renal transplant is to be performed you need to do a blood grouping as well as a HLA matching that is mandatory blood grouping and HLA matching is mandatory I hope this is fine with everybody moving further now moving to the next thing that is ectopic ureter okay so now talking about the ectopic ureter most common site for an ectopic ureter usually the ureter does not open into the urinary bladder rather it opens at some other place okay so the most common site for an ectopic ureter in males would be posterior urethra most common site for ectopic ureter in males would be the posterior urethra whereas most common site for ectopic ureter in females is distal to the distal sphincter okay the distal sphincter to uh, distally to it the male, uh, female ectopic ureter will open as in males <coughs> it opens into the posterior urethra the males would usually present with recurrent urinary tract infections whereas in females as it opens distal to the distal sphincter there is no control of the urine therefore there would be dribbling incontinence continuously there would be dribbling of the urine I hope this is fine what should be the treatment for ectopic ureter then it is ureteric re-implantation treatment for ectopic ureter is re ureteric re-implantation it should be again re-implanted into the urinary bladder then talking about the next condition that is posterior urethral valve okay posterior urethral valves and please remember posterior urethral valves are the most common anomaly of the urethra posterior urethral valves are most common anomaly of urethra okay so it is more commonly present in boys so please remember posterior urethral valves are very very common in boys okay they are much 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 more common in boys as compared to girls the most common site would be distal to veru montanum distal to the veru montanum so usually in the male urethra there is a elevation known as veru montanum so distal to the veru montanum there would be presence of this posterior urethral valves right then this posterior urethral valves they can either be complete valves which can cause complete obstruction or they can be incomplete or partial valves right if there is a complete valve there would be retention of urine therefore the patient will present to us an emergency right and therefore in emergency our main aim should be to relieve the patient for his symptoms and the main aim should be to relieve the, uh, the to relieve the retention of urine and for that we can do a urethral catheterization with just a foley's catheter so please remember usually this valve is a one-way valve 
urine cannot pass through it but a catheter from outside can easily pass okay so from outside you can pass a catheter so urethral catheter can be inserted or if not possible then a supra cath can be inserted what is a supra cath supra cath is nothing but a supra pubic cystostomy okay it is a supra pubic cystostomy when you actually enter uh, enter with the trocar into the bladder directory okay and from there you drain that is a supra cath then talking about incomplete posterior urethral valves here the patient will not have as such retention of urine but there would be uh, cases of recurrent urinary tract infection right recurrent uti would be present in incomplete or partial valves investigation of choice would be so investigation of choice for posterior urethral valve is mcu investigation of choice for posterior urethral valve is mcu very important investigation of choice for posterior urethral valve is mcu that is micturating cystourethrogram right or avoiding cystourethrogram right important then what should be the treatment the treatment would be transurethral resection of the valves okay so you will go via the ureter urethra and you will resect the valves okay transurethral resection of the valves or you can also uh, do a fulgration of the valves okay important then if i talk about this image first what is this image this image is a ivp picture okay this is a intravenous pyelography picture right over here you can see what over here you can see a characteristic appearance known as the drooping lily sign okay here you can see that <clears throat> the structure like lily is formed okay important but over there it is drooping okay one side it is drooping down so this is known as a drooping lily sign and drooping lily sign is a feature of duplication of renal pelvis and ureters when there are double renal pelvis and double ureters usually the upper renal pelvis and upper ureter will sub compress the lower renal pelvis of the ureter okay so drooping lily sign is a feature of duplication of renal pelvis and ureter du drooping lily sign is a feature of duplication of renal pelvis and ureter important whereas the next image that you can see down here it is again a ivp image but in this ivp image it is very important because it has been asked twice in the examination so this ivp image here you can see what so please remember this is a characteristic sign when the intramural part of the ureters okay or the intramural part of the ureters or the ureteric orifice okay it is partially closed okay so narrowed ureteric orifice or a partial atresia of the ureteric orifice will lead to dilatation at their mouths and this dilatation is known as a uretro seal this dilatation is known as a uretro seal so this is a uretro seal and uretro seal on ivp gives which appearance important so uretro seal on ivp gives a cobra head or a adder head appearance uretro seal on ivp gives a cobra head or a adder head appearance right so it is due to a narrowed or a stenos ureteric orifice so treatment would be just a excision just a cut would be given okay so treatment would be a incision uh incision should be given at the ureteric orifice i hope this is clear but if this incision extends okay that can lead to a complication and that would be vasico ureteric reflux that would be a vasico ureteric reflux reflux of urine from the bladder to the ureters vasico ureteric reflux is a complication of this incision given in cases of uretro c then if you talk about cordy what do we mean by cordy so please remember cordy is nothing but a downward curvature of the penis due to presence of a fibrous band okay if there is a presence of fibrous band in the penis that would lead to a downward curvature of the penis okay and how to differentiate it from peronis disease then so please remember in peronis disease also there is a fibrous plaque in the penis okay and that also leads to a downward curvature of the penis but in cordy usually the penis would be curved downwards even <clears throat> even when it is not erected but in peronis disease a downward curvature is seen only when the penis is erected i hope this is clear so please remember downward curvature of penis due to a fibrous band is known as cordy right and what should be the treatment of cordy then so please remember we need to do the cordy correction okay we do a cordy correction along with that we do a urethroplasty we do a urethroplasty and for that urethroplasty we usually use the prepuce or the foreskin right we usually use the prepuce or the foreskin therefore this was a question which has been asked therefore circumcision is contraindicated in cases of cordy circumcision is contraindicated in cases of cordy due to the reason because prepuce is to be used for urethroplasty then if i talk about this image over here that you can see okay normally the 
urethral orifice is present at the tip of the penis at the tip of the glands right but what happens at times the urethral uh, urethral orifice would not be present at the tip rather it would be above that is known as epispadias and more commonly it is below okay below the penis on the uh, posterior aspect of the penis and this is known as hypospadias this condition is hypospadias okay it can be at various places as given in this image but the most common type of hypospadias is glandular most common type of hypospadias is glandular most common type of hypospadias is glandular whereas least common is perineal least common is perineal therefore perineal is the most severe type also right and what is to be done for hypospadias then so please remember usually hypospadias we did not do anything okay no correction is required as such okay important then if i talk about the next one that is udt that is undescended testis okay also known as cryptorchidism undescended testis is also known as cryptorchidism i hope you are all aware of this that the testis usually they are formed in the abdominal cavity and then after, during birth they usually descend down via the inguinal canal into the scrotal sacs right important so during their invagination sometimes what happens usually these testes they cannot descend down properly so they remain in the abdominal cavity or they are arrested at the inguinal canal level itself okay so both of these can lead to undescended testes or cryptorchidism right most common site for undescended testes would be inguinal canal most common site of undescended testes would be inguinal canal they will get arrested at the level of inguinal canal most common cause would be idiopathic right what should be done for diagnosis for diagnosis we do a ultrasound abdomen and a ultrasound scrotum okay if we do a ultrasound scrotum we will find empty scrotal sacs right and if we do a ultrasound abdomen maybe we could find the testes lying in the abdominal cavity or in the inguinal canal i hope this is fine okay this is the usual diagnostic method of choice for uh, that is ultrasound abdomen and ultrasound scrotum but the best technique if asked if they ask the best technique though it is not practical but it is the best or the gold standard technique as i've always told <coughs> best or gold standard techniques are not always practical right so the best technique or the gold standard technique for undescended testes would be diagnostic laparoscopy diagnostic laparoscopy or laparoscopy would be performed just for the diagnosis of undescended testes that's the reason why it is not practical right treatment of choice would be orchidopexy treatment of choice for undescended testes is orchidopexy we will bring down the testes and fix it in the scrotum sac okay pexy is fixation right so orchidopexy and what is the age in which orchidopexy generally done so please remember 9 to 12 months of age okay orchidopexy in undescended testes is done at 9 to 12 months of age orchidopexy in uh, undescended testes is done at 9 to 12 months of age because there is a reason till 9 months of age a normal descent of testes can be seen okay in spontaneous descent of testes can be seen till 9 months of age so we wait till 9 months of age then talking about the next condition that is pelvic ureteric junction obstruction okay puj that is pelvic ureteric junction obstruction it is more common in males so please remember pelvic ureteric junction obstruction that means where the renal pelvis and the renal ureter and the ureter starts okay so please remember this is the renal pelvis and this is the ureter okay so please remember at this junction this is known as the pelvic ureteric junction right so there can be obstruction of this pelvic ureteric junction it can be either due to atresia that means this pelvic ureteric junction is not formed right that is atresia okay or it can be due to high insertion okay if there is high insertion also it can cause obstruction because the urine could not flow right if it is this way so It, if it is due to absence that is atresia then the treatment would be anderson heinies dismembered pyloplasty okay so you are actually reconstructing the renal pelvis therefore it is known as pyloplasty so for atresia of puj there would be anderson heinies dismembered pyloplasty but if there is only high insertion then you will perform a foley or kulps pyloplasty then you will perform a foley or kulps pyloplasty and the investigation of choice would be a dtpa scan i hope you are quite aware from radiology dtpa scan is a type of nuclear scan done for renal function assessment right so dtpa scan is performed dmsa scan is for renal morphology okay m for morphology dmsa important it is then moving further talking about the next condition and that is bladder rupture okay important topic <coughs> so pay attention please 
सो इन ब्लैडर रपच्चर देर कैन बी आई दर इंट्रा पेरिटोनियल ब्लैडर रपच्चर और एक्स्ट्रा पेरिटोनियल ब्लैडर रपच्चर द मोर कॉमन वन इज अ एक्स्ट्रा पेरिटोनियल ब्लैडर रपच्चर मोर कॉमन वन इज अ एक्स्ट्रा पेरिटोनियल ब्लैडर रपच्चर ओके सो फर्स्ट टॉकिंग अबाउट द इंट्रा पेरिटोनियल ब्लैडर रपच्चर द मोस्ट कॉमन कॉज ऑफ इंट्रा पेरिटोनियल ब्लैडर रपच्चर वुड बी अ ट्रॉमा टू अ ओवर डिस्टेंडेड और अ फुल ब्लैडर okay if a bladder is over distended and if there is trauma to that then it can lead to a intra peritoneal bladder rupture okay trauma to a full bladder or over distended bladder it can usually happen when a patient has not voided before surgery okay therefore a slight uh, touch also with a sharp instrument to the bladder can rupture it right so please remember that is the reason why the bladder is to be kept emptied before a surgery right so it can happen during surgeries also or it can also happen in beer drinkers okay who have a over distended bladder and they have a trauma after that so most common cause for intra peritoneal bladder rupture is trauma to a over distended bladder and the bedside test would be a peritoneal tap okay just you inject a needle and aspirate okay ek syringe se you will aspirate if you get urine in that that means like uh, you can say okay there is a intra peritoneal bladder rupture investigation of choice would be a cystogram investigation of choice would be a cystogram that means a bladder study is done right cystogram treatment would be so please remember as now if there is a intra peritoneal bladder rupture and as you all know peritoneal cavity is a serous cavity okay very clean cavity therefore if there is urine into the peritoneal cavity that can lead to peritonitis therefore the treatment should be laparotomy peritoneal lavage along with bladder repair and then we should insert a catheter for drainage okay so important what is the treatment of choice for intra peritoneal bladder rupture laparotomy plus peritoneal lavage plus bladder repair plus catheterization i hope this is fine if you see the image of intra peritoneal bladder rupture on a ct scan this is how it will look okay it will give us sun burst appearance it gives a sun burst appearance so please remember when you inject the dye the dye will spread out over there in the peritoneum so a sun burst appearance is seen for intra peritoneal bladder rupture then if we talk about extra peritoneal bladder rupture the most common cause for extra peritoneal bladder rupture is pelvic fracture most common cause for extra peritoneal bladder rupture is pelvic fracture right and the treatment for this is simple that is just a catheter drainage treatment is just simple that is a catheter drainage if we look for extra peritoneal bladder rupture we can find a tear drop shaped bladder and this is known as a tear tear drop deformity or a tear drop bladder so tear drop bladder is a feature of extra peritoneal bladder rupture tear drop bladder is a feature of extra peritoneal bladder rupture whereas sunburst appearance is seen in intra peritoneal bladder rupture okay so after bladder rupture first of all i would also like you to remember this one this image had come earlier okay here you can see the shape of the bladder has changed and it has become christmas of fir tree shaped okay so please remember this is known as the christmas tree or a fir tree appearance christmas tree or fir tree appearance of urinary bladder is a feature of neurogenic bladder christmas tree or fir tree appearance of bladder is a feature of neurogenic bladder when the tone of the new uh, bladder is lost right <coughs> then if we talk about urethral rupture now <coughs> urethral rupture it can be either anterior urethral rupture or a posterior urethral rupture okay more commonly it is a anterior urethral rupture more commonly it is the anterior urethral rupture so anterior as we discussed it can be either a penile urethra or the perineal urethra so please remember usually it is the perineal or the bulbar urethral rupture anterior it is the perineal or bulbar urethral rupture and the most common cause for that would be a perineal trauma most common cause would be a perineal trauma and this perineal trauma can be due to this manhole covers this image had come once in the examination okay this type of injury can cause so this type of injury can cause a anterior urethral rupture this type of injury causes a anterior urethral rupture okay this is a injury due to the manhole covers which causes a perineal trauma right and the triad for anterior urethral rupture would be first is retention of urine second there would be a perineal hematoma third there would be blood at the tip of the exter uh, external urethral meatus right so triad of anterior urethral rupture first retention of urine second perineal hematoma and third blood at the tip of external urethral meatus okay this type of hematoma is usually seen okay in perineum if we see this blood butterfly shaped hematoma okay 
In perineum, we can see this butterfly shaped hematoma. Okay, so please remember it is a feature of anterior urethral rupture. Butterfly shaped hematoma is a feature of anterior urethral rupture. Okay, important. Then, if I talk about the next one, investigation of choice. Investigation of choice for anterior urethral rupture or for that matter for both anterior as well as posterior urethral rupture Investigation of choice is retrograde urethrogram Investigation of choice is retrograde urethrogram RGU as we have discussed for urethritis RGU Treatment would be a supracat that is suprapubic cystostomy Okay, suprapubic cystostomy <coughs> You will directly drain the urine from the bladder itself Then talking about the posterior urethral rupture Posterior urethra mein membranous urethra commonly ruptures. Okay, so membranous urethral rupture is commonly seen in posterior aspect. Most common cause for posterior urethral rupture is pelvic fracture. Most common cause for posterior urethral rupture is pelvic fracture. And the triad of posterior urethral rupture would be two features would be same. First, retention of urine would be there. Second, blood at the tip of external urethral meatus would be there. Retention of urine and blood at the tip of external urethral meatus. But the third feature changes. In anterior, there was a perineal hematoma. In posterior, there is a pelvic hematoma. In posterior, there is a pelvic hematoma. <coughs> Important, right? Moving further now. <coughs> Talking about urolithiasis now. Urolithiasis means renal stones or bladder stones. Okay, so please remember, urolithiasis means stones. So primary stones are usually formed in the kidney. Okay, primary stones are usually formed in the kidney. Whereas secondary stones, they are usually formed in the bladder. Secondary stones are formed in the bladder. Okay, most common cause for renal stones would be, so it is important. Most common cause for renal stones is idiopathic hypercalciuria. Most common cause for renal stones would be idiopathic hypercalciuria. Okay, e increased levels of serum calcium. Right, so... Now talking about the types of renal stones. We have discussed this already. So just revising it once again. Most common type of renal stones are calcium oxalate stones. Most common type of renal stones are calcium oxalate stones. And calcium oxalate stones can either have monohydrate crystals or dihydrate crystals. More common ones are the dihydrate crystals. More common ones are the dihydrate crystals. Then usually calcium oxalate crystals are formed at which pH? So please remember these are usually pH insensitive. They can form either in acidic or in alkaline pH. Okay. So please remember calcium oxalate stones are pH insensitive. They can form at any pH. Then the crystals which are seen in calcium oxalate stones would be. So in monohydrate uh, stones we can find dumbbell shaped crystals. Monohydrate stones, dumbbell shaped crystals. Monohydrate stones, dumbbell shaped crystals. Whereas dihydrate stones, we can find envelope shaped crystals. Dihydrate stones, we can find envelope shaped crystals. Then if I talk about the next one, that are struvite stones. Okay. So struvite stones are nothing else but triple phosphate stones. Struvite stones are nothing but triple phosphate stones. They are seen at which pH? So please remember, struvite stones or triple phosphate stones are commonly formed at alkaline pH. They are commonly formed at alkaline pH and alkaline pH would be seen in cases of infections so please remember during infections okay which type of stones would be formed in kidneys these would be your struvite or triple phosphate stones in UTI right and the crystals of triple phosphate stones are coffin lid shaped okay so coffin lid shaped crystals in triple phosphate stones coffin lid shaped crystals in triple phosphate stones then if I talk about the third type of stones, which are the hardest stones. So please remember the hardest renal stones are cystine stones. Hardest renal stones are cystine stones. And these are usually formed at a acidic pH. These are usually formed at a acidic pH. And these have which type of crystals? These have hexagonal or polygonal crystals. These have hexagonal or polygonal crystals. Right? Important. Then if I talk about this image guys, what is this? So please remember. <coughs> Here you can see a x-ray on x-ray you can see a calcified stone in the kidney and this is a very large stone Which has taken the shape of a pelvic aliceal system. Okay, it is the it has taken the shape of the renal pelvis now, right? So if a stone takes the shape of a renal pelvis and it is very large in size This is usually a triple phosphate stone These are usually the triple phosphate stones and such type of stones are known as staghorn calculi Such type of stones are known as staghorn calculi then if I move further, okay, usually all of these stones will be calcified. They will contain calcium. Therefore, they would be radio opaque. Most of these stones are radio opaque, but some of the stones are radiolucent. Some of the stones cannot be visualized on X-ray or CT scan. 
okay because they are radio lucent and the mnemonic would be pg lux that is <coughs> the stones which are radio lucent are p for parotid stones p for parotid stones g for gall stones g for gall stones l for lysine okay l for lysine stones u for uric acid stones u for uric acid stones and x for xanthine stones x for xanthine stones important right so please remember uric acid stones are important uric acid stones are seen in conditions of hyperuricemia that is gout so uric acid stones are seen in cases of hyperuricemia or gout and which type of crystals are seen in uric acid stones so please remember usually we can say needle shaped crystals but usually they do not have a fixed shape there are irregular shaped crystals in this okay then if i talk about the urinary bladder stones now urinary bladder stones most common type of urinary bladder stones in children are triple phosphate stones most common type of urinary bladder stones in children are triple phosphate stones and most common type of urinary bladder stones in adults are uric acid stones most common type of urinary bladder stones in adults are uric acid stones i hope this is clear then i if i say what is the earliest feature of stones so please remember the earliest feature of stones would be increased urinary frequency okay please remember increased frequency of micturition or urination is the first or the earliest feature in cases of stones important right whereas the most common symptom would be pain most common symptom is pain whereas the earliest symptom would be increased urinary frequency okay now if we talk about the ct scan that you can see over here you can see a radio opaque structure that is nothing but a renal stone in the kidney over there right on the other hand this image is a x ray which shows a large huge calcified structure in the place of the urinary bladder this is a giant bladder stone and this image had come earlier in the examination okay the same type of image okay giant bladder stone was given right important then if i talk about the pain okay so now the pain in cases of renal stones differs so you need to know at least these three to four types of pains so please remember pain in cases of kidney stone would be a lumbar pain or a loin pain 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 in cases of kidney stones would be a lumbar or a loin pain right at the back then pain in cases of upper one third ureteric stones okay if a stone is present in the upper one third of the ureter okay so upper one third ureteric stones there would be a lumbar pain radiating to the testes in males whereas perineum in females so please remember upper one third ureteric stones there is a lumbar pain radiating to testes or perineum radiating to testes or perineum if the stone is at the pelvic brim and this was a question which has been asked if a stone is at the pelvic brim okay there would be lumbar pain radiating to the inner thighs lumbar pain radiating to the inner thighs is a feature of pelvic brim stone <coughs> then if there is a urinary bladder stone in urinary bladder stone there would be a supra pubic pain right urinary bladder stone there would be a supra pubic pain okay but if there is a stone at the bladder neck now okay a stone at the bladder neck or a urethral stone so stone at bladder neck or urethral stone there would be a supra pubic pain referred to the tip of penis in bladder neck stone or urethral stone there would be a supra pubic pain which is referred to the tip of the penis for diagnosis of stones what should be done so please remember the first line investigation can either be a ultrasound or it can be a x ray kub okay ultrasound or x ray kub kidney ureter bladder right whereas the investigation of choice would be a ncct kub investigation of choice would be a ncct non contra ct scan kub i hope this is fine please remember because most of the renal stones are radio opaque ncct is preferred in renal stones whereas the gall stones are radio lucent therefore ultrasound is the investigation of choice for gall stones as we have discussed already right moving further to this one now talking about the treatment of choice for kidney upper or middle ureteric stones if there is a kidney stone or a upper or middle ureteric stone the treatment of choice should be a eswl that means a extra corporeal shock wave lithotripsy a extra corporeal shock wave lithotripsy <coughs> right so please remember extra corporeal shock wave lithotripsy where usually via this machine the shock waves will pass through your abdomen and they will break your uh, renal stone if this renal stone is broken down into fragments now these fragments will line up okay now as you can see in the image below these fragments will line up okay and this is known as the stenstras phenomena these fragments line up in the ureter and they are excreted out via urine okay and when they line up in the ureter this is known as the stenstras phenomena which is seen after eswl right 
Then moving further, if there is a low ureteric stone, you okay. If there is a stone in the lower ureter, then it should be treated with ureteroscopy with dormia basket. Okay, it should be treated with ureteroscopy with a dormia basket, right? Then, if there is a urinary bladder stone, so treatment of choice for urinary bladder stone is a lithola paxi. Treatment of choice for urinary bladder stone is lithola paxi. Lithola paxi means passing laser waves. Okay, uh, we can go via the urethra also. Okay, transurethral um, surgery can also be done. That is known as lithola paxi, where laser waves actually cut down the stone into various fragments. Then, if we talk about large urinary bladder stone. <coughs> in this condition, lithola paxi cannot be done. Therefore, a large urinary bladder stone is usually treated with suprapubic cystolithotomy. You open up the bladder directly. Okay. So, large urinary bladder stone is removed by suprapubic cystolithotomy. Right. Whereas, urethral stone. Okay. Urethral stone should be treated how? So, please remember, if there is stone in the urethra, therefore, it should be pushed into the urinary bladder and it should be treated just like a bladder stone. A urethral stone should be pushed back into the urinary bladder and treated like a bladder stone. But if it is at the tip of the penis, then definitely you can directly remove it with the artery forceps or you can just give a cut and then remove it and apply sutures, right? This can be done. Then if we talk about renal tuberculosis now, renal tuberculosis, the earliest feature of renal tuberculosis would be here you can see on this IVP, here you can, we can find that at the renal papillae there are ulcers okay so renal papillary ulcers these are also known as moth eaten calysis earliest feature of renal tbs moth eaten calysis earliest feature of renal tbs moth eaten calysis right important okay then it will further progress to putty kidney okay first of all there would be accumulation of pus inside the kidney known as pyonephrosis then it will further progress to putty kidney when there would be calcification so here you can see the putty kidney, okay, which appears to be calcified on the x-ray, right? Then it will further progress to cement kidney even, right? <coughs> so this is important. Then if I talk about bladder care, bladder TB, bladder tuberculosis, the earliest feature would be narrowing of the ureteric orifice. Bladder TB, the earliest feature is narrowing of the ureteric orifice, okay? And then it will further progress to a thimble bladder. Then it will further progress to a thimble bladder. Okay, so narrowing of the ureteric orifice, the first stage of bladder TB is usually gives which appearance? It gives a golf hole appearance. It gives which appearance? It gives a golf hole appearance. Important. Okay, so please remember renal TB earliest feature is moth eaten calysis. Earliest feature of renal TB, moth eaten calysis. Whereas the last stage would be cement kidney. Right? Bladder TB earliest feature is narrow ureteric orifice known as golf hole appearance. Bladder TB earliest feature is golf hole appearance. Whereas the last stage would be thimble bladder. Last stage would be this thimble bladder. Okay. We are having multiple uh, perforations. Then if I talk about the most common or the earliest symptom of uh, renal or bladder TB. The most common or the earliest symptom of tuberculosis of the kidney or the bladder would be increased frequency. It would be increased urinary frequency. Whereas the investigation of choice would be a CECT abdomen. Investigation of choice would be a CECT abdomen. I hope this is fine. Moving further now, talking about the renal tumors, okay? So if we talk about the renal tumor, the first one is a Wilms tumor. The most important one is a Wilms tumor, also known as nephroblastoma. Wilms tumor is also known as nephroblastoma. It is common in children less than three years of age. It is common in children less than three years of age. It is usually a tumor having all the three cell lines. That means epithelial components, mesenchymal components, as well as embryonal components, okay? It contains all the three cell lines. Most common site of Wilms tumor would be the upper pole of kidney. Most common site for Wilms tumor is the upper pole of kidney. For that matter, for any of the renal cancer, the most common site is the upper pole of kidney. Then if I talk about <coughs> the gene mutations, Wilms tumor is usually hereditary and it is due to two gene mutations, WT1 and WT2 gene mutation, right? So WT1 gene mutation is associated with two, two important syndromes and that is a Wagner syndrome and Dennis Drass syndrome. At least remember the names. Okay, WT1 syndrome, uh, WT1 gene mutation is associated with Wagner syndrome and Dennis Drash syndrome. Whereas WT2 gene mutation is associated with Beckwith Widman syndrome. On which question has been asked? WT2 gene mutation is associated with Beckwith Widman syndrome. And what happens usually in Beckwith Widman syndrome? Important question from pediatrics. 
there is a hemi hypertrophy that means half of the body of the child will be hypertrophic larger in size okay so hemi hypertrophy is a feature of beckwith wedman syndrome right then most common symptom of wilms tumor would be so please remember most common symptom of wilms tumor is a abdominal mass most common symptom of wilms tumor is a abdominal mass along with abdominal mass there can be fever and hematuria so the triad of wilms tumor would be abdominal mass fever hematuria triad of wilms tumor is abdominal mass fever hematuria the first investigation to be performed again abdominal pathology so first line investigation would be ultrasound abdomen first line investigation would be a ultrasound abdomen investigation of choice would be a cct abdomen investigation of choice would be a cct abdomen treatment for stages 1 and 2 of wilms tumor would be surgery along with chemotherapy but stages for 3 and 4 for that treatment would be surgery along with chemotherapy along with radiotherapy right moving further now talking about the adult kidney cancer <coughs> if we talk about adult kidney cancer most common type is the adenocarcinoma adult kidney cancer ka most common type is the adeno carcinoma and the most common site from where it arises is the pct epithelium most common site would be the proximal convoluted tubule epithelium pct epithelium right most common type of renal cell carcinoma would be clear cell carcinoma most common type of renal cell carcinoma would be clear cell carcinoma important most common type of renal cell carcinoma is clear cell carcinoma right most common symptom of renal uh, kidney cancer is painless hematuria most common symptom of renal cell carcinoma is painless hematuria it is also the most common symptom of our bladder cancer so most common uh, symptom for bladder as well as renal cancer would be painless hematuria best prognosis in all renal cell cancer would be chromophobe type best prognosis of rcc is the chromophobe type where we get a plant cell appearance in chromophobe type we get a plant cell appearance and collecting ducts are affected in chromophobe type we have discussed this in pathology already right then talking about the most common paraneoplastic syndrome with renal cell carcinoma so most common type of paraneoplastic syndrome with rcc would be elevated esr increased erythrocyte sedimentation rate leading to polycythemia uh, due, due to polycythemia right then moving further <coughs> sorry then talking about so usually this is increased due to increased levels of erythropoietin right then if i talk about the investigation of choice investigation of choice for a renal cell carcinoma would be a cct abdomen as we have discussed if we take of fnc or a biopsy while we remove the needle the malignant spreads will uh, malignant cells will spread via the peritoneal cavity and through all the layers of the uh, abdominal wall therefore to avoid this risk the investigation of choice for such cancers would be cct abdomen also in liver cancers right treatment if the tumor is less than 4 cm partial nephrectomy is performed if the tumor is less than 4 cm partial nephrectomy is performed but if the tumor is more than 4 cm or if there is lymph node metastasis radical nephrectomy is performed if the tumor is more than 4 cm or if there is lymph node metastasis radical nephrectomy would be performed just telling you one more point about the uh, about the stones that you need to remember if the stone is smaller in size okay if the stone is usually less than 2 cm or less than 4 cm in size it can be treated with extra corporeal shock wave lithotripsy but if it is more than 4 cm it should be treated with pcnl that is a percutaneous nephrolithotomy percutaneous nephrolithotomy moving further now talking about the urinary bladder cancer most common type of urinary bladder cancer is transitional cell carcinoma most common type of urinary bladder cancer is transitional cell carcinoma right second most common is squamous cell carcinoma and if the question comes which is the most common type of bladder cancer associated with schistosomiasis then the answer should be squamous cell carcinoma most common type of bladder cancer associated with schistosomiasis is squamous cell carcinoma then which is the most common site for bladder cancer so please remember the most common site for bladder cancer would be your lateral wall most common site for bladder cancer would be your lateral wall followed by the trigone of the bladder the middle part right most common symptom as we discussed is a painless hematuria investigation of choice would be cystoscopy plus biopsy as uh, over here in bladder we can access bladder easily via you uh, via the urethra so we can send a cystoscope along with that we can send a needle and take a biopsy right so investigation of choice in urinary bladder cancer would be a cystoscopy plus biopsy <coughs> surgical treatment of choice if 
it is a superficial bladder tumor which has not invaded the mucosa now so superficial bladder tumor are usually treated with this procedure known as turp that is a transurethral resection of the bladder tumor transurethral resection of the bladder tumor but if it is a invasive bladder cancer then you need to treat it with radical cystectomy you need to remove the whole uh, urinary bladder this is known as radical cystectomy and a new urinary bladder is created and this new urinary bladder is created with the help of ileum this new urinary bladder is created with the help of ileum previously we used to do a urethrosigmoidostomy we used to open the urinary ureters into the sigmoid but there was a high risk of colorectal cancer okay that was that's the reason why it is avoided now talking about important condition that is prostate okay so prostate gland as we all know it is 20 grams in weight usually okay <coughs> and this prostate gland okay it is divided into five lobes or it is divided into macneal three surgical zones okay please remember it is divided either into five anatomical lobes or into three macneal surgical zones okay these zones are to be remembered it is important on from the point of view of the bph as well as prostate cancer so if we talk about bph that is benign prostatic hyperplasia so benign prostatic hyperplasia is more common in elderly males around 60 to 70 years of adult uh, elderly males it is more common bph most common site for bph would be transitional zone so here you can see there is there are three zones central zone transitional zone and the peripheral zone so most common site for bph is the transitional zone okay most common site for bph is the transitional zone types of bph either it can be a obstructive bph where there would be a post void residue the uh, urination would be obstructed okay these features would be seen whereas the other type would be an irritative type where there would be increased urinary frequency okay or there would be intermittent urination there can be nocturia okay so obstructive and irritative type the, uh, if we perform a digital rectal examination on digital rectal examination we can find a enlarged prostate gland right then if I talk about the investigation of choice, investigation of choice would be an ultrasound. Investigation of choice for a BPH is ultrasound. On ultrasound, you can find the post void residue. Post void residue means after the patient voids or after the patient urinates, then also there would be some amount of urine left in the bladder. This is known as the post void residue. Okay. So post void residue in cases of BPH would be more than 100 ml. Okay. And this is an important feature on ultrasound for BPH. Then drug of choice for BPH, as we have already discussed, it is a selective alpha 1A blocker and that is known as tamsulosin, a selective alpha 1A blocker. Okay. And to decrease the side of prostate, we can use an anti-androgenic drug that is known as finasteride. Okay. To decrease the size, we use finasteride. Then if I talk about the surgery for BPH, benign prostatic hyperplasia, it is this surgery which you can see in this image. Okay. So please remember it is a McCarthy's turp, okay, McCarthy's turp, that means a McCarthy's transurethral resection of the prostate, McCarthy's transurethral resection of the prostate and the most common fluid used for this turp would be glycine, most common fluid used is glycine. Now moving further, talking about prostate cancer. So prostate cancer is the most common type of cancer in elderly. So most common cancer in elderly would be prostate cancer. Most common cancer in elderly males is prostate cancer. Most common site for prostate cancer is the peripheral zone. Most common site for prostate cancer is peripheral zone. So you need to remember three P's. Prostate cancer, peripheral zone may common hai, and posterior lobe may common. Hai. Okay, peripheral zone or posterior lobe. So usually from prostate cancer, as we have discussed yesterday, also in yesterday's session, there is a metastasis from prostate cancer and this metastasis generally occurs to the lumbar vertebra. This metastasis mainly occurs to the lumbar vertebra via the Battison's plexus of veins, via the Battison's plexus of veins. And this type of uh, metastasis which occurs to the lumbar vertebra in prostate cancer is an osteoblastic metastasis. Whereas most of the cancer will lead to destruction of the bone, osteoclastic metastasis. But usually in cases of prostate cancer, the metastasis to the lumbar vertebra is an osteoblastic metastasis. You can see increased formation of bone in this part, right? Important. Then talking about the screening test. The best screening test for a prostate cancer would be a digital rectal examination on which you can find an enlarged prostate along with serum prostate specific antigen which is a tumor marker for prostate cancer serum PSA that is prostate specific antigen investigation of choice would be so please remember investigation of choice would be a prostatic biopsy but prostatic biopsy cannot be directly taken so please remember it is a transrectal ultrasound guided 
prostatic biopsy. It is a transrectal ultrasound guided prostatic biopsy. <coughs> the sentinel lymph nodes for prostate cancer would be so please remember the sentinel lymph nodes for prostate cancer are the obturator lymph nodes. The sentinel lymph nodes would be the obturator lymph nodes. Right? Then if the prostate cancer is localized, okay, if the prostate cancer is localized only till the prostate gland, then just a radical prostatectomy is done. Only the prostate is removed, that is radical prostatectomy. But if it is advanced, it has spread to other organs or it has spread to lymph nodes. Then that invest then the treatment of choice should be a hormonal therapy. Okay, then usually we prefer hormonal therapy. This was a question which has been asked in August 2020, which is the surgery, uh, which is the cancer which is usually treated with hormonal therapy. Okay, it is the prostate cancer, right? And it is treated with drugs like luprolide, right? Then I talk about the next condition and that is Peyronie's disease. Okay, so now we talk about the penis now. So First condition is Peyronie's disease and I told you how you need to differentiate between a cordy and a Peyronie's disease. In both the condition there is a fibrous uh, cord. Okay, in cordy there is a fibrous cordy which uh, fibrous cord which is present. Whereas in Peyronie's disease there is a hard fibrous plug. In Peyronie's there is a hard fibrous plug. But important thing in Peyronie's the flaccid penis is completely normal. Flaccid penis is completely normal. Only curvature, downward curvature would be seen in cases of erection. Okay, a curvature towards the affected side is seen in cases of erection only. What should be the treatment for Peyronie's disease? So please remember, it is a self-limiting condition. So therefore, reassurance should be given. Peyronie's disease may treatment should be reassurance. And if a patient wants an operation, therefore you can recommend him the nest bits operation. You can recommend him the nest bits operation in which usually we apply a non-absorbable suture on the other uh, part, okay, or the non-affected corpora cavernosa, right? So please remember in uh, one corpora cavernosa, there is a hard fibrous plaque which is leading to curvature. So in the other corpora cavernosa, we can apply a non-absorbable suture which will stabilize it. This is known as the nest bits procedure or nest bits operation. Then if I talk about priapism now, what is priapism? So priapism is a persistent painful penile erection. Okay, it is a persistent painful penile erection <coughs> which can occur due to enthusiastic sexual intercourse. Right, that is known as priapism. Most common cause of priapism is usually idiopathic. Most common cause of priapism is usually idiopathic. If they ask most common cause of priapism in children, then it is sickle cell anemia or leukemia. Most common cause of priapism overall idiopathic. Most common cause of priapism in children, sickle cell anemia or leukemia. Usually sickle cell anemia or leukemia, there is a vasoocclusive crisis, right? In sickle cell anemia, all of us know there would be these sickle cells would actually go and block the vessels that would can lead to vasoocclusive crisis. And one of the vasoocclusive crisis can be priapism. Then if I talk about the treatment for priapism, it would be aspiration of blood from the corpora cavernosa, right? So penile erection is due to increased blood flow to the penis. Therefore, we need to aspirate the blood from the corpora cavernosa. Whereas the other treatment can be a cavernosa glandular shunt. The other treatment can be a cavernoso glandular shunt. I hope this is clear. Now, moving further with this image first. Okay, what is this image? So first image shows inability to retract the prepuce behind. Okay, inability of the uh, inability to retract the prepuce or the foreskin behind. This condition is known as phimosis. This condition is known as phimosis. And phimosis is generally treated with circumcision. Phimosis is treated with circumcision. The next condition usually shows inability to bring back the retracted prepuce. Okay, the prepuce or the foreskin was retracted, but now there is an inability to bring back the retracted prepuce. It is usually due to edema which has set in. Okay, it is usually due to a edema which has set in. Okay, important. So this is known as paraphimosis. This is known as a paraphimosis. So in this condition, usually you can use ice to reduce the edema and then you can retract back the prepuce. Otherwise, if uh, not, uh, if the ice therapy fails, then you definitely can just give a slit. Okay, important. Then talking about penile cancers. Okay, if we talk about penile cancer, the most common type of penile cancer would be a squamous cell carcinoma. Most common type of penile cancer would be a squamous cell carcinoma. This is the image. Okay, ulcer of proliferative growth is usually seen. Okay, a ulcer like and a proliferative growth is usually seen on the penis. That is a penile cell carcinoma. Most commonly squamous cell carcinoma. Most common site for penile cell carcinoma, penile carcinoma would be 
glands of the prepuce. Most common site for penile cancer is glands of the prepuce. Prepuce means the foreskin. Okay. If both are there in option together, both, then that would be the best option. Glands plus prepuce. If not, <coughs> try to uh, choose prepuce first because in most of the cases it is the foreskin or the prepuce which is affected commonly. Most common cause of penile cancer would be poor hygiene. Most common cause of penile cancer is usually poor hygiene. Right? Investigation of choice for penile cancer is a biopsy. Investigation of choice for penile cancer would be a biopsy. Right? Important. You can take a biopsy easily from the pen penis. Right? The staging investigation of choice would be a MRI. As we have discussed usually in GIT, the staging investigation of uh, the staging investigation of choice in GIT was CECT. Staging investigation of choice in C uh, GIT was CECT. But staging investigation of choice for penile cancer is a MRI. Staging investigation of choice for penile cancer is a MRI. Right? So then talking about metastasis, it is important. Okay? So please remember, penile cancer will drain into the lymph nodes, and the principal lymph nodes of pen penis are known as Cabana's lymph nodes. Okay, the sentinel or the principal lymph nodes of penis are known as the Cabana's lymph nodes because Cabana was the one who actually brought this concept of sentinel lymph nodes. Okay, which are the first affected lymph nodes in any of the cancers, right? So Cabana's lymph nodes are usually seen in penile cancer. Then if we talk about treatment of choice. If we can preserve 2 centimeters of penis, okay, if we can preserve at least 2 centimeters of penis, we can perform a partial penectomy. But if we cannot even preserve 2 centimeters of penis, then we need to perform a total penectomy. We perform a total penectomy. Most common cause of death in penile cancer would be torrential hemorrhage. Most common cause of death in penile cancer is torrential or excessive hemorrhage, right? Then moving further, talking about the next condition and that is testicular torsion. Testicular torsion is what? So please remember when actually the testis gets twisted, okay? And this condition can lead to a sudden severe abdominal or a scrotal pain. This condition usually leads to a sudden severe abdominal or a scrotal pain. Along with that, there would be redness and warmth of the uh, scrotal sac. Along with that, there can also be a low-grade fever, okay? It will closely res resemble an inflammatory condition known as epididymo orchitis, inflammation of the epididymis and testis, okay? So testicular torsion closely resembles epididymo orchitis. Testicular torsion, the most common age group is 10 to 25 years. Most common age group is 10 to 25 years. And the most common cause of testicular torsion would be bell clapper deformity. Most common cause of testicular torsion is bell clapper deformity. Then most common clinical feature usually would be sudden severe abdominal or scrotal pain along with redness, right? And there can be low grade fever too. Then how you how do you differentiate between a testicular torsion and a epididymo orchitis. <coughs> so please remember, you differentiate it with a clinical test known as French test. Important, okay? So you differentiate both of these conditions with the French test, okay? So you actually try to elevate the scrotum. If on elevation of scrotum, if the pain is relieved, it is no, it is a epididymo orchitis. Elevation of scrotum relieves pain, it is epididymo orchitis. So French test is positive in epididymo orchitis. Whereas French test is negative, that means even on elevation of scrotum, pain is not relieved. That is, French test is negative. This is seen in cases of testicular torsion. Okay. Now, if they ask you about the treatment, first of all, uh, you can see this image over here. What is a bell clapper deformity? Okay. Now, usually, along with testis, when it descends down, a layer of the peritoneum also descends down, and that is known as a tunica vaginalis. That is known as tunica vaginalis. So usually this tunica vaginalis is covering one part of the testis at least, okay? So it covers one part of the testis. But when it is only invested on the top of the testis, when it is only invested on top of the testis, it usually, the testis will usually hang like a bell in the, uh, the testis will usually hang like a clapper in the bell, okay? The testis usually hangs like a clapper in the bell. This is known as a bell clapper deformity. And it is more prone to undergo testicular torsion, right? Best treatment for testicular torsion would be a immediate scrotal exploration. Best treatment would be a immediate scrotal exploration. If you have a portable ultrasound which can be performed easily, then definitely you can perform an ultrasound prior, but otherwise a immediate scrotal exploration is the best treatment. Okay. Now if a patient presents to you within 24 hours of testicular torsion, okay, if you are performing the surgery within 24 hours, then the testis would be viable. 
in this condition you need to perform a derotation and orchidopexy orchidopexy pexy means fixation orchido means testis so fixation of the testis right so in viable or 24 hour within 24 hours you perform a derotation along with orchidopexy but if the patient presents after 24 hours that is a non viable testis then you remove the testis that is orchidectomy then you remove the testis that is orchidectomy and in both these conditions usually whether it is viable non viable you always need to perform a contralateral orchidopexy because in both the <coughs> scrotum or both the testes there would be a bell clapper deformity therefore you also fix the other testes okay this is known as a contralateral orchidopexy also it is a preventive measure or a prophylactic measure then if i talk about the next condition that is varicocele okay varicocele is what Okay, so please remember varicocele is just an abnormal dilatation of the pampiniform plexus of veins. I hope all of you are quite aware, testis drains via the pampiniform plexus of veins, right? So abnormal dilatation of these testicular veins known as pampiniform plexus of veins is known as varicocele, okay? Usually, <coughs> they would be dilated and torturous veins which will give a bag of worm feel or a bag of worm, okay? On uh, palpation, they will give a bag of worm feel. On palpation, they give a bag of worm feel. Important, right? Most common cause of varicocele is idiopathic. Okay. Investigation of choice for any vascular pathology, as we have already discussed, it is a color Doppler. Investigation of choice would be a color Doppler. Whereas treatment of choice would be a ascending scrotal sclerotherapy. We need to sclerose these vessels now, right? So ascending scrotal sclerotherapy, and the most common agent used is polydocanol, right? Moving further. And to the last slide now. So first one is hydrocele. Okay, hydrocele is what? So hydro means water, right? So hydrocele is nothing but accumulation of fluid in the processus vaginalis. Okay, accumulation of fluid in this processus vaginalis is known as a hydrocele. Most common cause is usually filariasis, right? In lymphatic filariasis, we can see a enlarged scrotum now. It is due to this hydrocele only, right? There are three types of hydrocele you need to remember. First is a vaginal hydrocele when the fluid accumulates in the scrotal sac okay when the fluid accumulates in the scrotal sac it is known as a vaginal hydrocele which is the most common type of hydrocele when fluid accumulates in the scrotal sac vaginal hydrocele when fluid accumulates in the inguinal canal infantile hydrocele fluid accumulating in uh, inguinal canal infantile hydrocele and when the fluid accumulates in the peritoneal cavity or there is a connection between the peritoneal cavity and the tunica vaginalis then this is known as a congenital hydrocele. So in congenital hydrocele, there is a connection you can see over here between the peritoneal cavity. Okay, important. And the processus vaginalis. Right? And the treatment of choice for congenital hydrocele, this was a question which has been asked. It is important. So it is a herniotomy. Treatment of choice for congenital hydrocele is a herniotomy. Treatment of choice for a congenital hydrocele is a herniotomy. And it is generally performed after 3 years of age. It is generally performed after 3 years of age. Right? Then, if they ask you the most common clinical feature, the most common clinical feature definitely would be a scrotal swelling. Okay, it would be a scrotal swelling, just like in this image you can see, okay. right. And you can perform a test known as this trans elimination test. You can pass light from one side and you can see the elimination on the other side. This is known as a trans elimination test, which would be positive in cases of hydrocele. <coughs> so, trans elimination test is positive in cases of hydrocele, right, important because there is just an accumulation of fluid, right? Whereas it uh, it would have been a mass, then please remember it would have been a mass, then the light would not pass. Transemination test is negative in cases of mass, okay? So please remember transemination test is positive as we had discussed earlier also. In cases of a posterolateral neck swelling that is cystic hygroma. Second, in cases of hydrocele. Third, a submandibular swelling known as ranula. It is a retention cyst, ranula, in that also. Along with that, also meningocele. In these conditions, usually, the uh, transemination test is positive. Moving further, okay, so a treatment of choice now. Treatment of choice for hydrocele either can be a Jabulis operation, okay, a Jabulis operation or it can be a Lord's plication surgery. In Jabulis operation, we can just open the open the sac, okay. In Jabulis operation, we just open the sac. But in Lord's plication surgery, we open the sac, okay. <coughs> in Jabulis operation, we open the sac and we just do a eversion and drain all the fluid. That is, uh, that is it, okay, in Jabulis procedure. 
But in Lord's plication surgery, we open up the sac, we drain the fluid, and we evert the edges and we ligate them. Okay, we evert and ligate the edges. Okay, you can see me doing this over here. Okay, in the surgery. So please remember, it is a Lord's plication surgery which has been done. Then, talking about testicular tumors now. Testicular tumors they are more common in younger males. Okay, testicular tumors are more common in young males. Important, right? Whereas in elderly males, the most common tumor was or the most common cancer was prostate cancer in elderly males. Whereas in young males, the most common testicular tumor is you know, the most common cancer is a testicular cancer or a testicular tumor, right? Most common type of testicular tumor is a seminoma. Most common type of testicular tumor is a seminoma. Whereas most common type of testicular tumor in an elderly would be a lymphoma. Most common type of testicular tumor in an elderly is a lymphoma. Earliest clinical feature would be a heaviness in the scrotum. Earliest clinical feature of a testicular tumor would be heaviness in the scrotum. Whereas the most common clinical feature would be a scrotal enlargement. Most common clinical feature, scrotal enlargement. Investigation of choice would be a CECT scrotum. Investigation of choice would be a CECT, right? And tumor marker is alpha fetoprotein. Tumor marker is usually alpha fetoprotein. Also, we use one another tumor marker that is LDH, lactate dehydrogenase, right? What is the surgery? So please remember we need to remove the testes. Okay, we perform a high inguinal orchidectomy. We perform a high inguinal orchidectomy. And the uh, testicular tumor can also be treated with radiation. Okay, and the only tumor which is most radiosensitive it is seminoma. So the testicular tumor which is most radiosensitive is a seminoma. So seminomas can also be treated with radiotherapy. With this I wind up surgery. Thank you so much. And let's meet in another session, okay, uh, of medicine after a few days. So till that, good luck, goodbye. Thank you so much.